Tonight on The Buzz, we're talking about the cloud and how to use it for collaboration, project management, and client review. We start with Serena Catania, an award-winning independent filmmaker, on how she's used cloud-based collaboration software, along with her thoughts on a documentary, earning the Best of Show Award at the 2016 Berlinale. Next, George Alver is the co-founder of Movidium, a creative network that allows brands, agencies, and filmmakers across the globe to connect, collaborate, and create films. This week, he explains what Movidium is, why ad agencies and filmmakers are joining the Movidium community, and how it simplifies collaboration and project management. Next, Melissa Davies Barnett is a post-production industry veteran, a co-founder of SideFX Inc., and now the co-founder and CEO of ARC9. ARC9 is an online service designed for collaboration and simplifying the creative workflow and client reviews. All this plus Tech Talk, a Buzz flashback, and Randy Altman's perspective on the news. The Buzz starts now. Digital Production Buzz is brought to you by Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com and by ImagineProducts.com, the workflow experts. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking, Authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current. Uniting industry experts. Production. Filmmakers. Post-production. And content creators around the planet. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. And welcome to the Digital Production Buzz, the world's longest running podcast for the creative content industry covering media production, post-production and marketing around the world. Mike Horton has the night off. Tonight, we're talking the cloud and collaboration. We'll start with Serena Catania. Not only is she the supervising producer of the buzz, but as an independent filmmaker, she's been using cloud services for a while. We'll talk with her about her experiences, what works, and what doesn't? Also, because she just got back from the Berlinale Film Festival in Berlin, I want to get her reactions to what she saw. Then we'll talk to two new cloud service providers, Movidium and Arc9. Each wants to improve the creative process, especially during production, but they go about it in two different ways. We'll talk with George Oliver, the co-founder of Movidium, and Melissa Davies Barnett, the co-founder of ARC9, to learn what their services do, how they compare, and which one might be right for you. Also, just as an aside, remember stereoscopic 3D? It was all the rage just a few years ago, and tonight's buzz flashback returns us to those days gone by. Also, I want to remind you to subscribe to our free weekly show newsletter at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Every issue every week gives you an inside look at the buzz, quick links to all the different segments on the show, and curated articles of special interest to filmmakers. And best of all, every issue is free. I'll be back with Serena Catania right after Randy Altman's perspective on the news. This is Randy Altman's perspective. Randy Altman has been writing about our industry for more than 20 years. In fact, she's the editor-in-chief of her own website at postperspective.com. And as always, I am delighted to say, hello, Randy. Welcome back. Hi, Larry. Good to be back. Well, the Oscars are over. Did all your winners win? <laughs> um, I don't know if they all won, but a lot of them won. I, I was Pretty impressed with the showing for Mad Max Fury Road. Took a lot of the technical side of the Oscars in terms of uh, editors, audio post. So it was fun to watch those guys coming coming up and down from from the stage. It was interesting thinking of technical issues. The Martian didn't win any. I know that was a surprise. There were a lot of surprises, and everybody thought that the Revenant was going to uh, take. Best Picture, and it, and it didn't, which was pretty interesting. So, But what I did like, getting back to Mad Max, is, you know, they didn't win Best Visual Effects. That went to Ex Machina. So um, that was double negative and also Milk VFX. And the interesting part of that was there was actually a lady visual effects artist up there collecting an Oscar. She is one of two women who have ever collected a VFX Oscar. Uh, the last one was for Aliens. So... 
that, and I think three have been nominated ever. So that was a really big deal. It was really nice to see. So that it was is. nice to see that something off the beaten path won and that a lady went up and, and got an Oscar. So what are your takeaways from this? Are, are there some vast reading of tea leaves and goat entrails that we can draw from the Oscar voting this year? It was pretty diverse, I think. I mean, other than Mad Max getting the six out of the ten nominations, uh, I, I think it was fairly diverse. And I kind of I kind of like that. I mean, there were couple of surprises in there, but I, I really thought that The Revenant was going, not that I agreed, I just thought that The Revenant, there was this whole big sort of um, build-up coming. Um, but I was, uh, it was nice to see Mad Max and George Miller get a lot of notice. Well, I was also work. impressed that Spotlight won, because it, it was a smaller film, and it had a really important message, and the cast did a great job, as, as did the cast inside the big short. I thought both of those were excellent excellent ensemble films. So um, Revenant is amazing, but um, I think the right movie won from my point of view. I agree. I agree. And, and, and the editor for Mad Max won, which was pretty amazing, too. But it could have very easily been The Big Short and or Spotlight, too. I mean, there's some... I, I thought there were some really good movies this year and some really good artistry that went on. And oh. uh, I was... I was uh, my favorite part of the entire Oscar uh, broadcast was Mark Mangini from Formosa, who came up to collect his uh, his audio Oscar for Mad Max. He had more enthusiasm than I think anyone else on that stage. It was a <laughs> ton of fun to watch. Randy, what website can people go to to keep track of all of your thinking? Postperspective.com. And Randy Altman is the founder and editor-in-chief of Postperspective.com. Randy, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Larry. To read more from Randy Altman, visit PostPerspective.com. Still to come on The Buzz. When you're working with media, one thing is essential. Your computer needs peak performance. However, when it comes to upgrading your Mac, there are so many different options to choose from that the process can be confusing. That's why Otherworld Computing carries the best upgrades that lets your computer performance and storage grow as your needs grow. Since 1988, OWC has become one of the most trusted names in quality hardware and comprehensive support to the worldwide computer industry. With an extensive online catalog of Mac, iPhone, and iPad enhancement products, as well as a dedicated team of knowledgeable experts providing first-rate tech support, OWC has everything you need to take your current system to the next level. Whether you need to maximize your system's memory, add blazing speed, or enhance reliability, look no further than the friendly experts at OWC. Learn more by visiting MacSales.com today. That's MacSales.com. Serena Catania is the supervising producer of The Buzz, as well as a filmmaker, journalist, former senior executive with United Artists and MGM. She's also one of the founders of the Sundance Film Festival, and today I have no idea where she's coming from. We're going to just tune in and find out. Hello, Serena. Welcome back. Hi, Larry. Nice to see you this time. Give me a, give me a clue. You've talked to us from Belgium and from Germany. Where are you now? I'm actually back in beautiful downtown Burbank. <laughs> Soaking up some blue skies and warm weather again. Oh, yeah, terra firma. It feels good to be in my own bed, but I have to tell you I'm a little jet lagged. You must be too, though, right? Well, yeah, but I was only in London. You were in Berlin. You were far, far east than I was. <laughs> By the way, thinking of Berlin, before we start talking about the Berlin Alle, you wanted to correct something you said the last time about the voice. We got an email from one of our listeners in the Netherlands who has been a fan of the Buzz for a long time, and he says, I think you may be mistaken. The voice actually originated in the Netherlands because I worked on it, he said. <laughs> so I did some research, and it turns out that a lot of those what we consider American icons, like American Idol, Dancing with the Stars, Homeland, Shark Tank, Trading Spaces, Ugly Betty, you name it, many of those shows originated in other countries. So I was, I was surprised by that. 
And I just wanted to apologize to all of our editor fans in the Netherlands and tell you thank you for a great show. We obviously love it here because it's doing really well. <laughs> Well, one of the reasons that you were trans you were traveling in Europe as much, not only shooting your own film, but you were attending the Berlinale. And I wanted to get your take on what sticks in your mind from the Berlinale now that it's over. A couple of things. The political the political awareness of international audiences is much greater than I believe that it is in the United States. We have great entertainment and we're getting more and more uh, cognizant of worldwide issues, but I think we tend to be a little bit more closeted. Uh, there were two documentaries that actually screened in competition, and one of them won for the first time in the 66-year history of the Berlinale, Fuku Amari, which was Fire at Sea. I believe I spoke to, to you about how much I loved it the last time we talked. It won the Golden Bear. And major kudos to uh, Rossi, who was the Italian director, because he actually embedded himself on the island of Lampedusa for a year. And when he won the award, he actually brought his daughter up on stage and promised he'd make up for lost time with her. I thought that was was so cute. But he, uh, yeah, he, he lived on the island for over a year, embedded himself. And the, the one thing about Fukumari that I think is very interesting is there's been a trend, and I know I've been doing it more and more in the last few years, of not using narration, voiceover narration at all, creating more of a dramatic um, approach to your your documentary films, and that's what Rossi did. There was no narration, and he juxtaposed two stories, the story of this young 12-year-old boy who lives on the island and watches his grandmother making pasta and listens to music, and then the horror of what's happening with the refugees that are coming in from South Africa and, um, and other countries. So it, it, was, it was very impactful, and I think both the audiences and the jury loved it. Meryl Streep specifically commented about it. Um, so I thought that was amazing. And then the second documentary was an American documentary by Academy Award winning producer Alex Gibney, uh, director Alex Gibney, and it was called Zero Days. And it talked about the Stuxnet virus, which infected millions and millions of computers and actually almost brought down the Iranian nuclear capability. It was the first time in the history of viruses that we know of that uh, I's and O's, ones and zeros, can, um, can actually affect physical environment when they land at the other end. Hmm. Uh, the interesting part about Zero Days is that it very clearly implicated the United States all the way up to the Obama administration for having caused it and started it. The other imminent threat is Nitro Zeus, which is the one that's being developed now, and they're thinking could cause EMPs and other kinds of global chaos. So it's really scary. But on the positive side, a documentary one, and that was Fuku Amari, and I think that's really good for all of us independent filmmakers who are out there working really hard and not making a lot of money, as they said at the Academy Awards, just because of the love of film. But do you think that there's going to actually be an influence on these wins on documentary filmmaking? Is, is there going to be some legs to this? I do. It's already picked up a distributor. Fukumari's being distributed worldwide now. It will go on and actually make money because it's the kind of film that appeals to audiences, uh, and, as opposed to some other documentaries that have a very niche audience. I think this one has a much wider audience. But looking at it, not just in terms of, of the, that film itself, but other documentary filmmakers, yourself and many others, are there coattails you can ride? Yes. Any time a film makes money, you know there's going to be an influx of opportunities. There were over 70 documentaries screened at the Berlinale in various categories, and they had a track at the EFM about how to make money with documentaries. I think that combined with what's happening with all kinds of reality television and the way audiences are changing the way they watch media, I think there's a great future for documentaries. So I'd tell all of our listeners to just keep on doing what you're doing. I know I am. <laughs> well, I like the fact you said there were over 70 documentaries that were screened. Do you have any other stats in terms of how many people attended Berlinale or how many films there were? There were a total of, I believe, over 430 films and almost 400,000 tickets sold, 370-some thousand tickets sold to the public. So that tells you how excited the public is in Germany for these films. And people come from all over the world, actually. And they wait in line all night to buy tickets. 
I want to shift gears because I want to shift from watching finished films to creating films because what we're doing today is we're focusing on online collaboration, project management, workflow software. And we'll be talking with, with two companies a little later today. We're going to talk to Arc9 and we're going to talk to Movidium in terms of how their cloud-based software can enable filmmaking. But you have been using collaborative software for a while. What have you noticed? Is it helpful? Is it more problems than it's worth? Is it something that other filmmakers need to pay attention to? Give us your background. I think that anyone who's working with editors that are not local to your project, which is happening more and more, you have to have some kind of collaboration. Um, it depends on whether you're using it for editing purposes or, or strictly for client approvals. I use it for both. If I'm using it for editing and I need to upload major files that are several gigs each, I can't upload to any service that I know of right now without waiting a long time. The bandwidth isn't there yet. So that means that if you're... If you need to get something to your editor, like in Australia or in Germany, you literally have to ship a drive. And I'm becoming more and more attached to SSD drives for that for two reasons. They're very reliable. They, they don't break as often as the, as the other spinning drives do. And they're very light. So for international shipping, they're cheaper. But in, in terms of collaboration, I use, I use Collaborate a lot, which is another service I don't think that you're going to talk about today. But I've used them, for example, when I cover conventions and I need an editor to cut something very quickly. We actually used it on the buzz when I sent some files in to the buzz whether it's uh, stills, music, effects, video, you can upload all of those elements and then your editor can work long distance and send you back a cut that you can then annotate frame by frame. If you want to say at this frame there is a, you know, cut this two or three frames shorter or add music here or I don't like this cut here for this reason, can you do this? It's just invaluable. I can't get on a plane and go to Australia and there's time differences there with the editor I'm working with there. So he can look at it at his own time. But if all you're doing is transferring files, Dropbox or Hightail would do that. What's the advantage of, of the more sophisticated software? They don't let you amass a crew. Uh, they don't let you. Well, you can get the business version of Dropbox, but then all you're doing is shifting files around. You don't have annotation capabilities. What Collaborate allows me to do is have more than one person take a look at the video and then annotate right on the video with time code what needs to be changed or what they want me to pay particular attention to. You can't do that with any of the simple file transfer services. It's a different type of service. Have you ever used any of the online call sheets or, or production tools that are out there? I've, had, I've worked on productions that have used electronic versions of documents and distributed it to their crews because it's much more efficient than having a PA stay up late at the end of the night and then distribute everything to your hotel, although many productions are still doing that. Yes, I do. I've used call sheets, electronic call sheets. They're very convenient. Um, Doddle. Originally, James, James, I believe, was the first one to start doing a very sophisticated version of the electronic call sheets, and they do a really good job. Serena, I want to keep touch with you because there's so much stuff that's going on in the, in the cloud-based collaborative environment. Not only the people we're talking to today, but we're going to see a whole lot more evolution over the next several months as, as we come up to and exceed uh, NAB, and I'd always love your opinion on what's happening here. Where can people follow you and keep track of what you're up to? They can go to filmvault.biz or thecataniagroup.com. That's all one word, filmvault.biz or thecataniagroup.com. And the Catania herself is Serena Catania. <laughs> Serena, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Larry. Still to come on The Buzz. Imagine Products has been specializing in workflow applications for over 25 years. They started with executive producer back in 1991, an all-in-one logging and offline editing tool. In 2006, ImageMind was used in the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics and ShotPut Pro was released. Today, there are more than 30,000 ShotPut Pro users worldwide. Pre-roll post for Macintosh was released in 2012. This is an LTFS archiving application compatible with any LTO tape drive, as well as Sony's ODA. 
pre-roll post for Windows was released at the end of 2015, it's the only LTFS archiving application of its kind for less than $500. Imagine Products has three simple goals for its software. Make it powerful, make it easy to use, and make it affordable. It's easy to see why Imagine Products has been successful for 25 years. Imagine what comes next. Visit imagineproducts.com to download a demo. George Oliver is the founder of Movidium, a creative network that allows brands, agencies, and filmmakers across the globe to connect, collaborate, and create films. Hello, George. Welcome back. Larry, great to be here. We had a chance to talk a few months ago, but just to sort of give us some background, how would you describe Movidium? So, Larry, Movidium is a professional creative network and project management application for filmmaking. So it's two things, really. It's a, a professional social network where filmmakers, agencies, and production companies can come and build a presence for themselves. And also it's a project management tool where they can streamline their process of production using our feature set. Well, you were one of the founders. Why did you decide to start the service? Exactly. So I was one of, one of the founders of Movidium, uh, along with Alex Vero. Alex and I have been... Uh, in the processes of film production for 12 years. We've worked for a great number of Fortune 500 and FTSE 250 businesses. And during that experience and time, we learned a lot about the filmmaking process. We delivered some sort of remarkable projects with some amazing teams from all over the world. And we just thought some of these things we were doing on a day-to-day -day basis could be improved with a layer of technology. So on today's show, we're talking with three different web-based collaborative platforms. What makes yours unique? Why should people consider you? I, I think what's interesting about Movidium, and it kind of dives deep into the sort of theory of building software, which is it's, it's a bundling up of a number of great features. So it's a hub. So, so it's a one-stop shop. Um, there's a number of solutions out there which are single-featured and ha have some great um, elements to them. But what we've done with Movidium is, is, is try to bring all those tools into our project management. And then not only just have that as a project management facility for our users, but also to fuse that with the human resource and the talent that actually operates those tools. So really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intersect of talent and productivity, which is what's exciting about Movidium. Well, give me a sense of how we use it. When do we dial into the service and, and, and what do we get from it? So uh, let's just take a, an example for an agency in New York. They might have a brief to produce a piece of content or film in London or in Paris. And how do they go about doing that? Well, they probably look through their Rolodex of DPs, directors and editors that they have in these locations, and, and they maybe potentially fly a, a team out there. Well, it's business as usual, but that dashboard is in our profiling section. So you can research local talent and but maybe people that might be more suited to that brief. And so you can find the team of best fit based on your exact needs. And as we find that people commissioning films are, are brands and agencies and sometimes internal at brands or internal at production agencies or even creative agencies, there's more demand for filmmaking. So giving them simple access to the global creative means of production is, is a very attractive and appealing thing in this very demand, you know, content hungry world. So one way to think of Movidium is a, a online global Rolodex? Ultimately, that's, that's one way of looking at it. it, it, it you know, it's, it's a so professional social network. So it's a place where filmmakers come and showcase their expertise, their work, who they've worked with, their unique skills, and ultimately present themselves to brands and agencies who might want to commission them. So it, it's just raising visibility for filmmakers and production companies uh, inside the global ecosystem of filmmaking. The so last time we spoke, Movidium was still in beta. Now, sure. that was a while back. So it's time yeah. to get an update. What's the newest news? So, I mean, the really exciting news, Larry, is that we're, we're releasing a, a mobile app for, with all the features in very, very soon, within sort of the next two or three weeks. We're, we're also coming to the US. Actually, on the 12th of April, we'll be doing a, a great, a big presentation at the Tribeca Film Festival, just, just, bef just before the start of the Tribeca Film Festival at the uh, C Crosby Street Hotel. Um, that's it. It's for our American community of uh, agencies and filmmakers. Uh, and then we're going on to NAB 
Um, then we're going down to New Orleans for collision and then back to Los Angeles to, to communicate with some of our, our, our team and, and, and wider production companies in LA. So a big trip around the US, which is where we see a, a large part of our community. From New York to Las Vegas to New Orleans, you're not going to get any sleep at all for the better part of a month. It's going to be pretty brutal, Larry. It's very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Something I, something I did learn, though, from reading your Kit Plus, Larry, uh, is that when at NAB, we've certainly got comfortable trainers. Oh, yeah. My goodness. When we were, um, we were just talking about the fact that, that a, a typical use would be an agency, whether New York sure. or L.A. or Las, Las Vegas or anywhere else, but an agency that's looking to go outside its, its normal area, and it needs to find staff to do that. So we've got the Rolodex aspect of Movidium, but there's also the project management. Tell me more about that. So our project management features include you know, a timeline tool, a task tool, a video revisions tool, uh, a, a feed of chat, which can be into project or into team, um, an ability to store assets related to that project. So rushes, brand guidelines, um, brand logos, all within a, a, a dashboard interface for, for the project. So it's bringing the creative means of production, the, the filmmakers, into the project, as well as all the assets, as well as all the sh scheduling. And we've got a couple of exciting Gantt charts and budget features coming up soon as well. Very exciting, Larry. Filmmakers always love those. Are you targeting the commercial audience? I'm thinking agencies here. Are you targeting more filmmakers? Or who's your typical audience? It's a very interesting question. And I think if, if I look at uh, who, who is using Movidium very effectively now, brands and agencies in the commercial market are very, very effectively. But we also see independent filmmakers use it. And we've got a couple of feature films that are using some of our project management features to stream. So I think what the way we look at it is the processes of filmmaking are nearly the same. It just depends on the level of investment, the size of the team. So, so the processes and structures that you go through are practically the same, whether you're making a commercial or a feature film. And we're, we've developed a solution that will expand to all areas of the of the moving image production but initially the focus is probably brands and agencies wanting to do commercial work how, how do they use the service so i'm signing up i go to movidium.com i type Correct. i'm in what's walk me through the the setup process so so, so for filmmakers, brands, and agencies, the ability to set up a profile uh, to represent yourself on the platform is completely free. Um, to enter the project management tools is $5 a month. And also we're offering uh, very soon the ability to pay freelancers through the system. Um, the agencies find the project management tools are very streamlining, very efficient. You know, it takes a lot of disparate tools that they've been using and puts it all in one place. And we, we all know what it's like to get feedback from clients on text message, on voicemail, on telephone call, on, a, on Excel sheets, and even on a fax from time to time. It can be confusing. Um, so so we've, we've put that all into one place. And so the whole agency team and potentially the clients at certain aspects of the project can, can see it and feed back on it. So it, it's really just raising the visibility on what's going on. So in this busy world that we need to produce a lot of content, uh, everyone involved, all the stakeholders, can see the project developing in front of them. Well, go, go more into this project management. Do we have things like Gantt charts and timelines and, and projected completion dates? How, how extensive is it? Exactly. We have a very significant timeline um, right at the top of the, the project dash management dashboard. And, and uh, yes, Gantt charts has been a very requested feature, and we've looked into that, and that will be integrated very, very shortly. I mean, I think Gantt charts were, 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 were heavily utilized in, in, you know, in the last 10 years of filmmaking. I think we want to look at it and really have a think about how we can make it suitable for the screen and administrative layer of, of, of making you know, projects work. So... It will look something like a Gantt chart. Whether it's actually a Gantt chart, that's something for our users to feed back with us. How about uh, client review and uh, commenting on videos in process? Well, exactly. We've got, a, we've got a revision feature that sits right in the center of the Movidium project management proposition. So you upload your, or upload your film or, or a version of that film, and you can annotate uh, comments on it by clicking on the screen and other users and the editor. And so you can assign uh, points back to an editor or back to a visual effects artist uh, or, back, or, or even send that uh, a version of that through a, a micro site to, to, a, to a client. You might want to have their feedback that then comes back to you. So there's, 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 there's team feedback within the creative team making it, but there's also the ability to send it off to the client. Because again, the client's perspective is very different from the team that creates the work. 
One of the things that I'm worried about with the cloud, aside from the fact that the assets are stored where I have no control over them, is just security in general. And we can't turn a newspaper page these days without discovering new companies that have been hacked or, or ransom demands. I mean, the, the World Wide Web is a scary place right now. How do we make sure that, that something which is so deadline critical as a video project is going to be secure? I think it's a very important question. It's one that we take very seriously at Movidium. And, and this starts both at the, at the very start of our process of looking at code and how we do peer-to-peer -peer review of our code. Uh, we, we test the integrity of the site with bringing others to, to, look, at, to look at the platform from a secure perspective from third parties. Um, we partner with, with very um, you know, large cloud service businesses which have a very good focus on, on, on security. I mean, our Movidian platform is hosted on the AWS infrastructure, which is the Amazon Web Services, uh, which might be very well known to you. It's certainly known to a great number of large organizations in the US. Uh, and, and we have um, you know, very, very clear perspective of the, the, the technical and uh, security landscape, which we regularly look at to make sure we're up to date. Um, you know, having con your, your reference to having control over the, your footage, you have total control over it. You can choose whether, where to put it, what projects to put it in, how to move it around, when to remove it. Um, and I think, I think the idea of a physical hard drive in your office in Los Angeles might potentially be less secure than, than the cloud. And how is it priced? How much money am I investing? So, so the, the, the project management features are $25 a month. Um, there's the ability to submit a brief, which should, soon will be a, a charge feature. And then we have an enterprise level package for some of the larger agencies, part of Havas, Omnicom, and the WPP group, for example. Um, they might well be, be using the system with an enterprise custom package where we give them direct access to uh, tr training, guidance on, on who to select from the talent perspective based on their, their, their guidelines and recommendations. If I'm a filmmaker and want to put myself, profile myself on Movidium, is there a fee for that? That's absolutely free and we're delighted to have you there. The Movidium community is, is, is incredibly diverse and, and very rich in the content that it puts up. All our, all our profiles have the accessibility to, to blog and update what you're up to on them and we find very, very interesting stories uh, being discussed in the community often. Have you announced how many users you've got? How many people we on profile? We haven't announced the number of users that are profiling, but there's several hundred agencies a week uh, signing up to the platform looking for talent to work with because they're very excited about, you know, working with people that might be more, more talented or more interesting or more creative than the existing network that they have. Nothing like more competition for a person trying to get a job, I tell you. You're making our lives both better and more difficult at the same time. I, I think, I think um, Movidium is, is challenging for the uncompetitive and the people who, who, who don't invest in building a presence and, and celebrating the work they've done. I mean, I think there is, there is uh, you know, a team of best fit for every project and whatever level of the business that you're working in, uh, exposure in that environment, you know, you, you've got to be in the marketplace and, and that's what a profile will do for you on the video. Where can people go on the web to learn more about you and your service? So, Movidium.com uh, is our homepage and it's free to sign up and, and please do come and investigate some of the profiles and, and conversations that are going on the site. Um, so that's, uh, that's our homepage and, and it would be great to, uh, to, to have a conversation with you, Larry, on our podcast for our community. George, I'd enjoy that. George Oliver is a co-founder and CEO of Movidium and Movidium.com. George, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here, Larry. Still to come on The Buzz. Tech Talk. If I have a clip, and let's go find our project clip. Oh, I know. Let's let's import this one.
This is the world famous sea turtle. Let's go back to our editing layout so we have a preview window. There we go. And we'll find the appropriate spot. We'll set it in. And we'll set it out. Edit that down to the timeline. This is a sea turtle. I don't need the, um, the audio, so let's just option click on that, get rid of the audio. But I want to slow this turtle down right about there. I want to see the power in those flippers. Well, if I select the clip, go up to the clip menu, go down to speed and duration, there's this really nice new setting. Let's slow this down to 15%. And under here, optical flow shows up for the first time. What optical flow does is it invents new video. It's like in betweening. It invents new video based upon how pixels move from one frame to the next frame. And optical flow for slow motion can take slow motion and make it really smooth as opposed to make it sort of like a still frame, a slideshow that's dissolving from one slide to the next. Now this shot is going to have to, uh, to analyze for a bit and then after it's analyzed you can see that it needs to render. And this is playing back without rendering. If I go back to clip speed duration, remember you turn optical flow on in this menu. I'm going to slow them down to say 5%. And now as I play this, we can see, and let's just, let's make it 10%. That's just a shade too slow. Let's go to clip, speed duration, let's make it 10%, optical flow, click OK. And just to keep it simple, we'll, uh, We'll just render these, the first one right here. Delete this and render. Rendering is going to take a little bit of time, but uh, when it gets rendered, we'll show it to you. So I'll do a dissolve and be right back. Look at this. The analysis is done. Watch the playback of our turtle. Is that amazing or what? Optical flow is most relevant when we're working with extreme slow motion, below 15, 10%. What it does is it takes frame one, which exists in shot by the camera, and frame two, which exists in shot by the camera, and figures out all the intervening frames and creates brand new video to move the pixels from frame one to frame two and to create all those in-between states. Optical flow works the best where the background is not moving, where the background is basically uh, bland, where you've got a clearly defined object in the foreground. If you had a gray object against a, great back, a gray background, optical flow is not going to work really well. Here, for instance, I've got a turtle against a blue sea, and optical flow works great at being able to create extremely slow motion. We've never had this option in Premiere before, and it makes extremely slow motion like we would use Twixler for we can now use uh, Premiere. This is, this is really nice. Melissa Davies Barnett is a post-production industry veteran having founded Side Effects Inc. Side effects focused on digital visual effects compositing and animation. Today, Melissa is the CEO and founder of Arc9, where she and her team are creating products to solve inefficiencies in the creative workflow. And we continue with Melissa our conversation on web based collaboration software. Hello, Melissa, welcome. Hello, good morning. I have to ask first 
what got you interested in visual effects? This is not something women go into. Well, after college, uh, it was a brand new industry. We started experimenting with uh, doing things digitally instead of doing opticals. Um, and then we, my partners and I worked on freelance projects, talking people into doing digital effects as opposed to opticals. Uh, and then the whole industry just grew in the 90s. Exploded, I think is a better word, not just grew. Did you have a, in college, were you studying graphical effects? I mean, why, what, what attracted you to visual effects? No, I, um, I was an architecture major and did a um, documentary film with some of the film students. And um, I was in charge of the graphics. So we had to figure out how to you know, create the graphics, um, animate the graphics. And then after uh, college, I was offered a, position, a job in New York to do graphics. Um, went to New York for about six months and then moved to L.A. And um, my first project was with New Line. They had a feature that was direct-to-video DVD. Um, and they had no money. So I said, let's do it digitally. They're like, what? Uh, so we did, there was no money to do the optical, so we decided to do it digitally. And it was very experimental at the time. Uh, a lot of roto effects um, and there I met both of my partners in, in that project. We went on to do music videos, uh, started side effects, um, grew to about 50 artists, um, incorporated CG. Our shop was small, always stayed small, and we focused mostly on commercials. Um, did a lot of tennis shoes, soft drinks, and cars for many years. <laughs> well, then from side effects and from your visual effects background, why did you decide to create Arc 9? What was missing that you needed to create? You know, where we are is really in that, I kind of take us back to the early 90s, where um, we really had to teach a whole industry a, a new way of working as you know, the old film processes went out on, um, we had a big educational hurdle. And so now we're seeing that same kind of thing happen in workflow. Um, where you, people think that happened a long time ago, but it really didn't. I mean, um, there are still uh, agencies and production companies, mostly agencies, um, which is really where we're, our workflow is geared towards um, small uh, to large organizations that all that um, have a lot of collaborators um, and and an approval process. So this is is a big you know uh, they're still using FTP which we used in the early 90s. Um, they're signing into FTP sites and downloading and uploading and so I think it's hard for someone to understand on um, what the difference, what is collaboration and workflow and um, because there's so many tools out there that you can piece together. Um, so uh, what we really wanted to have was the ability to collaborate all over the world with artists uh, in easily um, and seamlessly. And, move away from everyone having to be in one building and it really didn't exist on um, not just review and approval but managing your project managing your your deadlines managing your teams integrating clients um and creating presentations so throughout the process while you're iterating you're presenting to a client um and the work has to look good, has to, you know, there's branding. Um, and we wanted to be able to bring that all together in one application and not have to have, you know, machine room with guys in the background, you know, converting files and uploading and downloading, uh, an edit bay, assembling everything, 
because the whole production process is really changing. There's shorter timelines. Um, everybody's spread on multiple projects. Um, so that's really all the things that we wanted to create Arc 9 for. One of the, the benefits of having all your creative people in one spot is just the ad hoc brainstorming and the small conversations that occur which spark ideas, which then turn themselves into something visual. How do you keep that brainstorming, collaboration, freewheeling spirit going on the web? We've integrated with tools like Spark and Slack uh, that more and more teams are using to, um, you know, to chat any time of the day, in and out, um, but really organized um, feedback. Um, so we're not, we, you know, as we go along in the development, we find more and more ways to bring teams together. Um, I, don't, I don't know that all location-based brainstorming will ever disappear, um, but um, it certainly makes it easier to have the ability, the flexibility to have people all over the world to be able to collaborate in one space. Um, obviously, live chat, um, live screen share, um, live reviews, combined with um, you know, uh, doing them interactively or any time of day that you want from anywhere um, makes it easier to get everyone's feedback because there, in every creative project there's a lot of feedback. Do you think of this as a, a collaboration tool, a team building tool, a project management tool? Where does it fit in the creative workflow? You know, collaboration is really broad. Um, Skype is a collaboration tool. On, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different collaboration tools. So we. We call Arc9 a collaboration and workflow tool. Um, taking all, all the processes that you do in a creative project and put it into one application. Um, so you can manage your teams, manage your assets, manage your deadlines uh, and your deliveries. You can uh, review and approve with uh, all different types of annotation tools. Uh, any kind of uh, content, video, design files, um, images, um, multi-page presentations, uh, and then on the back end you have um, all the analytics that go with that. Who's opened, who's viewed, who's, and it's, but it's all managed. Uh, in, so you can, um, you know, figure out uh, where things are in the review process. I'm not sure that anybody anybody else really has a review status of every single file that you have in a project. Um, so there's a lot that go, that's under the hood and we're trying to keep it, well, simple is, is a hard thing to do. So simple to me is not simple to someone else, but we tried to make it so that a producer or production manager has all the tools that they need a creative person only needs to know a little piece of it. A client has a very simple private client portal that's focused on feedback and approvals. Um, and you can also manage multiple companies, multiple brands um, with one sign-in, um, all in one application. How does it work? Okay, I go to the ARC9 website, which is ARC the number nine, ARC9.com. What do I do? So you go to ARC9 and you create an account. You um, can create libraries or projects. Um, you upload your files from anywhere. We, tr we tried to integrate as many sources as we could, you know, generally people use, so Dropbox, Box, um, Vimeo, YouTube. Uh, okay, wait, 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 time out, slow down, because I'm confused again. Why am I uploading files when I'm not sure what I'm doing yet? I mean, do I, do I need to upload something to be able to use Arc9, or can I collaborate with my team to come up with ideas before I invent files? Is, is the file upload the first part of the process after creating an account? 
Yes, we're not a design tool. So, um, you know, it's meant to take your creative, whatever, it could be a creative brief, it could be storyboards. Um, we don't, you don't create, like we're not Photoshop um, or a design tool. We're, we, you upload files, you collaborate on those files. Um, you can iterate those files. So um, we have version management where um, every version is stacked and managed. Um, you can compare one version to the next, to the next, um, in sync. How do we make sure that the stuff that we upload is secure? Especially with commercial projects when there's millions of dollars in launch uh, money hanging in the balance. If it gets out at the wrong time, that launch is destroyed. Cloud has, is, that's one of the big hurdles that we all have to get over is the embracing of cloud and the security around cloud. Um, we, we are, we follow um, all the MPAA guidelines. We are, we're, an, we're on Amazon. We have different levels of security depending on the, the user. Um, but everything is encrypted. Um, I'm, I'm really not the person to ask about all the security, but we do follow all the MPA guidelines uh, to ensure that everything is secure. When did you release the site? When did it go live? I, I believe we, we launched it live on the end of 2014. Really wasn't until, I would say, mid um, August 2015 that we had all the pieces that really worked together. Um, we launched first with review and approval and a little bit of asset management um, and then added in presentations um, and all along we've been building conversions. <clears throat> so right now we, we support over 300 different file types and video codexes. Um, and for example, on Arc9, you can take a Photoshop file, don't even convert it, take the Photoshop file, upload it, and we create, we render every single layer. So you have the ability to um, really work with your team and see every layer of a file and review it. Um, at, at the same time, a person on the other side can download the original raw file. So we're kind of storing two different things, uh, web web-based file and uh, the original raw file. And where can people go on the web to learn more about you and your service? www.arc9.com. That's all one word, A-R-C, the number nine, arc9.com. And Melissa Davies Barnett is the co-founder of Arc9. Melissa, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's time for a Buzz flashback, five years ago today. Zerobank is a marketplace for 3D content, mostly film content. So we have producers all over the world that are shooting with two cameras, stereoscopic content that can be used then in advertising projects, demonstration for products, or anything else involving 3D. This was a Buzz flashback. I want to thank this week's guest, starting with Serena Catania, an independent filmmaker and the supervising producer of The Buzz, George Oliver, co-founder and CEO of Movidium, and Melissa Davies Barnett, the co-founder and CEO of ARC9. There's a lot of history in our industry, and it's all posted to our website at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Here you'll find thousands of interviews, all online and all available to you today. And remember to sign up for our free weekly show newsletter that comes out every Friday. Talk with us on Twitter at DP Buzz and Facebook at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Our theme music is composed by Nathan Doogie Turner with additional music provided by smartsound.com. Text transcripts are provided by Take One Transcription. Visit takeone.tv to learn how they can help you. 
Our supervising producer is Serena Catania, and our show producer is Debbie Price. Our engineering team is led by Brianna Murphy and includes Ed Golia, Keegan Guy, and James Miller. My name is Larry Jordan, and thanks for joining us for the Digital Production Buzz. The Digital Production Buzz was brought to you by Otherworld Computing, providing quality hardware solutions and extensive technical support to the worldwide computer industry since 1988. And by ImagineProducts.com, specializing in workflow applications for over 25 years. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To stay connected and receive updates from the Buzz, sign up for our free weekly newsletter now. Or you can learn more about us on our website. And thanks for watching The Digital Production Buzz.